Hi everybody, and welcome to my introductory video on the Pentax 6x7 system. So this is the first system camera, in, in the most expansive sense, that we're going to be looking at in this series. Um, technically any camera that has replaceable lens is a system camera, but this 6x7, the professional system cameras, and we have videos for this coming up for the Canon F1 and the Nikon F3 soon, which are also system cameras. Uh, these, these system cameras have things such as interchangeable prisms, a huge lens selection, some have interchangeable backs, um, and other features that uh, interchangeable focusing screens, which is for me a key feature. Uh, other features which just aren't available on amateur entry level or even advanced amateur cameras. And so I have here the 6x7, the, the kit lens that it comes with, which is a 105mm f2.4 lens. It has approximately the same field of view as a 48 to 50mm lens in 35mm terms. Then I have the 55mm 1 to 3.5, which is, I think, the prettiest lens that I own, and it's a equivalent to a 28 millimeter in 35 millimeter terms. And then we have a 200 millimeter low telephoto, which is probably like a hun like a 135 ish. Yeah, I think it's a 135 in um, <clears throat> excuse me, or a hundred millimeter. It's, it's more like a hundred millimeter lens in F in um. 35 millimeter terms. To, to achieve the conversion between 6x7 and 35 millimeter, you multiply by a factor of just slightly less than 2. So for instance, the Pentax 6x7 system goes up to a 1000 millimeter lens, and its 35 millimeter equivalent is a 550. So the 35 is 55 percent in millimeter terms of the 6x7 equivalent. And what that means is the angle of view on the 55mm 6x7 lens is the same as the angle of view on the 28mm 35mm uh, lens. So that's, that's where the equivalencies come in. So let me move these lenses off to the side for just a minute. We'll get back to them later and these straps. It's hard to really grasp how big this camera is. I can tell you that I had to raise my camera an extra foot higher than I normally use it to shoot at in order to get the whole camera in frame, but it might just be best to put a 35 millimeter camera next to it. So it looks a lot like a 35 millimeter SLR, just obnoxiously large. And actually, when I used to, uh, the first time that I ever wore this, I called it my Flava Flav uh, camera because it was hanging around my neck, like the uh, like 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 Flava Flav used to wear that huge clock. And uh, the proportions on this thing are kind of amazing. So here's a 35 millimeter. It's a Pentax H3, and it's about the same size as a Spotmatic, maybe modestly smaller. And you can see that the length of the camera is basically the same as the height of the 6x7. That's how big this camera is. It's huge, and it weighs um, 5 pounds without a lens, 6 pounds. It's really amazingly heavy. With the lens, it's like 10 pounds, and that's in kilos. I think it's, I want to say it's 2-something kilos, like 2.6 kilos without a lens. Um, so anyway, very heavy camera. So it is, however, size that take uh, size removed from the equation. It is a medium format interchangeable lens SLR. It uses 120 film. It does not use the 35 millimeter film that most of the cameras in this series thus far have used. It has removable prisms. This one has the optional metering prism on it. There were four, uh, four prisms for this system. And the four prisms were the metering prism, which most people say is mandatory. We'll talk about that a little bit in the myths section that I added for this camera. Uh, and there was a standard prism that it had no meter. There was a waist level viewfinder. And by the way, this is the only prism I have. Otherwise, I would be showing them to you as I talk about them. 
there was a, a waist level viewfinder that would allow you to hold the camera like this down at your waist and, and see what you were shooting in front of you, or at least down below you. And there was a magnifying glass built into that prism. And then there was also a magnifying prism, which I've actually never even seen a picture of except in marketing catalogs. I, I think it was fairly uncommon. Uh, it seems like it would be a specialty type prism anyway. And uh, let's see, so this one has the metering prism, which is the most common kind. And in the third video in the series, we're going to do a three, three video series for the 6x7 because there's so much. We'll talk about the metering prism and some of, some of the advantages and disadvantages to it. The uh, camera has uh, shutter speeds from one second to a thousandth. B, X, and hidden on the shutter speed dial, there's a T setting as well. Uh, that's, uh, so that's a neat feature that it has, is, is T. A lot of SLRs just don't, unfortunately. T is very useful. The magnification and diopter uh, information, those vary by prism. But, to the best of my knowledge, all of the prisms had a 100% frame coverage. The metering prism had a diopter of negative one, but I don't know what it was on any of the others. Like, I'm sure it was more than that on the magnifying prism. Obviously, it's a magnifying prism, but I couldn't find out. I couldn't find the information on what they were. It was wasn't available. Uh, it has interchangeable focusing screens, and to the best of my knowledge, there were five that were available, as well as a number of third-party ones, and it it syncs its flash at one thirtieth of a second. So a 1 30th of a second flash sync is really slow. A lot of the cameras we've looked at have 1 60th, 1 1 25th. Even cameras made at the same time as these had 35 millimeter cameras had meaningfully faster flash syncs. And part of the reason is because this has an enormous mirror and shutter and it just takes a long time for them to cycle. And because it has, an, especially the shutter, the real problem with the flash is the shutter. Because the shutter has to be all the way open for the flash to operate when it's an electronic flash, uh, this shutter isn't entirely open until 1 30th of a second. So that's why it's got such a slow flash speed. Now there were three, sh uh, three lenses that were made that had built-in leaf shutters and those allowed daylight flash, uh, flash sync speeds up to 1 500th of a second. But it was a very complicated process. Um, and one, I don't have any of, the, any of the leaf shutter lenses, and I, I, I don't think I would ever need them. But uh, they were out there for people who did need daylight flash syncing. And then the last thing... Or, oh, not the last thing. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, there, this the Pentax six by seven mount is pretty fabulous. It's I think in my mind it's the most brilliant lens mount ever made, and I'll show you why. There's an inner bayonet mount here, which is pretty standard. Most cam all cameras that have inner have bayonet mounts have the inner bayonet mount. There's also an outer bayonet. So lenses from 35 millimeters up to 300 use the inner bayonet. Lenses from 400 to 1,000, and there was a 400, 600,000, and I think there was an 800, but don't quote me on that, used the outer um, mounting flan uh, bayonet. I don't have anything that uses the outer bayonet, uh, but having that outer bayonet on a lens mount allowed... Pentax some really good options when it came to creating new lenses because the larger lenses could have a slightly larger uh, rear opening which could allow for different functionality. I'm not a lens engineer so I'm not going to speculate on all of the advantages that would bring but it does serve a number of really good purposes in terms of lens compatible uh, lens diversity in increasing the lens range. Now the last thing. So as I was researching this uh, this video, I, I sent Pentax Repairs an email and, and asked uh, Eric for any special tidbits about this camera, because this is a camera he knows better than any other, and he knows this camera better than anyone else, possibly ever. And 
So he gave me this this tidbit of information, which I did not see anywhere else online. If, and if it hadn't been for Eric, I would not have this to share with you. Uh, so this right here is the dial that changes between 120 and 220 film. And if you bump this too hard, or if you drop it on this side, you know, so let's even say that you have your camera on a neck strap and it's swaying around too much and it hits like a wall or something, then hitting this too hard will crack the, the camera's frame. And when that happens, it renders your, complete, your camera completely inoperable and irreparable. So this is the camera's weak point, and in as much as possible, avoid hitting this area too hard. You should never drop your camera anyway. So it's, it's a very precise instrument in dropping any camera that's not a toy camera, but any dro dropping any serious camera can do very, very real damage to it, especially on the 6x7, dropping it over here. So the, cam the Pentax 6x7 was released in 1976, and it was targeted to the professional market. It takes images which are 60 millimeters by 70 millimeters, well actually they're, they're 55 millimeters by 70 millimeters, but uh, it, that takes 10, roll, 10 images per 120 roll, 20 images per 220 roll. So it was targeted to the professional market. It's an oddball frame size, but it's also called the ideal frame size, which is a marketing term. Let me be clear about that as a marketing person who called it the ideal frame size first. But 6x7 is the same ratio as 8x10. So enlarging 6x7 prints to the um, to an 8x10 print size means it can be done with no cropping. Now if you have a 6x6, which is a square format, you have to crop. If you have a 6x45, you have to crop. So the 6x7 allows enlargement with less, uh, with less cropping, which means, in theory, higher image resolution. In practice, in, in practice, not so much. We'll talk about Different film, uh, different format sizes in a bit, but uh, one thing is taking a 645 negative and a 6x7 negative. A 6x7 can be enlarged at most 25% more than a 645, even though it's got a little bit more negative space. You can't enlarge it very much more because uh, it's using the same film and it basically at the same resolution, and you'll start to see grain at the same enlargement rate. Anyway, that's a little bit off off the outline. The 6x7 is one of the most highly regarded pro cameras ever made. In fact, a lot of people will tell you that the 6x7 is better than a Hasselblad, better than a Raleigh, better than basically any other professional film camera ever made. And there are lens tests which show that this is true, and there are lens tests that show that it's untrue. And so it's a matter of opinion and what people are comfortable using and what people really have a need for in their professional level camera. It was the consummate system camera and very expandable, tailorable to almost any situation. There are some, some photographic situations where you don't really want to use a 6x7, but we'll get to that later. Uh, and but, but the 6x7 does have some drawbacks. There are only 10 frames on a 120 roll and 20 on a 220. The number of frames being odd like that makes contact printing extremely difficult. And you can't really contact print a roll of film, a, a, ten, or a 120 roll of film, onto a single sheet. When I use this and I go to store my negatives in my standard sheets, which are um, designed for 645, 6x6, and 6x9, I can't, use, I can't fit all of these on one sheet because of the frame layout. It's very frustrating. So I either have to stack two negatives in the same sheet, which if the negatives turn out badly, I don't have a problem with if I'm not ever going to use them. But if the negatives turn out well, I can't do that, so I have to use a second sheet that's then got three empty rows on it. It's a huge waste. Also, 6x7 slides, if you were to use a slide projector back in the day like they did, really look great. But 6x7 slide projectors are nigh impossible to find, and getting parts for them and slide holders is also very, very difficult. 
And that's just because this wasn't a, an incredibly common frame size. 645 is more common. 6x6 is more common. 6x6 slide stuff I find at garage sales still. Um, so anyway, sorry to get off topic there, but this was, this was manufactured by Pentax. From 1969 to 1976, Pentax manufactured the 6x7. This is a 6x7 MLU. In 76, they, con they started manufacturing the mirror lockup MLU and made that till 1989. Now, Pentax also retrofitted old 6x7s to have mirror lockup functionality. So it's not possible to just look at a serial number and say, oh, that was made in 1970, therefore it doesn't have mirror lockup. It might. If, uh, if you have an old 6x7 without MLU functionality, getting parts for it's become incredibly difficult and they're, uh, they're harder and harder to repair. So if you're looking for a 6x7 right now, the MLU is a preferable purchase to a 6x7 which does not have MLU functionality. It will be easier to repair and maintain in the long run. In 1989, Pentax introduced the 67, which revised the, the shape of the body. And then in 1998, uh, and they made that until 1998, in 1998 they revised the 667 to have an electromechanical operating uh, operating functionality and they changed the type of battery it used and made some other some other hardware changes to it and that was the 672 Pentax manufactured that until 2009 when they stopped stopped producing all film cameras all of them were made in Japan for the entire for the entire run uh, all of the 6x7s and 67s take the take the same lenses the, the, the mount stayed the same the flange focal distance was the same uh, then uh, the the 672 also when they made that they added some plastic components some, some high impact polycarbonate components to make the camera lighter this is all metal it's very heavy and walking around at for for it or with with it around my neck for a day you know I really feel it the next morning uh, the 6x7 did not have any predecessors this was a new invention for, for Pentax. It was concurrent with numerous 35 millimeter Pentaxes and the 645, and it was followed by nothing. Pentax does not support the 6x7 mount anymore. Uh, there are no plans to start making a digital 6x7, unfortunately, though it makes sense. I mean, a digital 6x7 would be like a $30,000 camera, and would compete with the 645, which is a more common format for professional photography anyway. And at this point, I, I would also submit that the 645 is probably, the 645D is probably a better system camera than a 6x7 would be. And the 645 can also take the 6x7 lenses with an adapter. There's an adapter to put 6x7 lenses on your K-mount cameras too. Uh, but the 6x7 could not take 645 lenses, nor could it take the uh, K-mount lenses. The, the image circle required for these is just much larger than those provide. So, uh, if you have your, your manual, and normally I don't share the manuals, but I have the actual manual for this, not one that I borrowed from a friend or whatever. So this came with my camera. So here's the 6x7 manual. It's as big as the camera. And if you have that, we're going to go through the manual right now and we're going to take a look at the features. We're going to start on the top. So we're going to go a slightly out of order from the way that the manual is presented. Let's see if I can adjust my lighting here a little bit. I think that looks okay. And so we're going to start over here on the right, which is different from the way that we normally do this, but this is going to I'm going to align this with the way that the manual is numbered. So over here we have the rapid wind lever. In your manual this is number 1. Sorry, this is the actual rapid wind lever. I have a um roll of paper of 120 paper in here right now, but not act, there's not it's not loaded with film. So when we open it up later you'll see that. When there's no film in here, the rapid wind lever just advances freely. Uh which is an intentional design element. Here we have the shutter release button. I'm using a soft release on my shutter. Let me take that off. 
the shutter release button. This is what's called a soft release. It looks like a little mushroom that you screw into it. And what it does is allow you to use a little bit, uh, use different force in pushing down the shutter. So it allows you to squeeze the shutter more than jamming it down and it reduces vibration. With the soft release on this, I'm able to get uh, photos, I'm able to handhold photos with my standard and wide angle lenses down to a 60th or a 30th of a second without noticeable camera shake on the negative. Uh, underneath the shutter release button, let me move the soft release again, there's a little switch that points to an orange dot, has an orange L and then a white dot. This is your shutter lock. If the lock is pointing, if the point on the back of it, which is on the camera body, the point is pointing towards the orange dot, it's locked. And then on the front of the camera body, there's a little grip that you can use to switch back and forth. You'll have to trust me on that. I can't seem to leverage it today to get it to, to, to uh, flip positions. That's the way that was supposed to go. Then we have the shutter, shutter speed dial, which is over here on this side. This is the shutter speed dial on the prism. There's another shutter speed dial underneath, and then this grip is part of the metering prism and uh, goes on top of the shutter speed dial on the camera. But the shutter speed dial shows you what speed you're set at. Here's, here's the index. The index isn't marked in the um, in the manual, but the little orange triangle there points to your, your shutter speed. We've got the viewfinder release button. There's a silver button on this side and a silver button on this side and you push down on those and you can take the, the prism off. And that's how you release the prism and we'll look at that when we in the third video when we talk about the metering prism. We've got the battery check lamp. Underneath the, the meter right there, you might not be able to see it turning on. It might not be turning on. Well, that little red thing right there uh, in the center of your screen now is the metering. When you push the battery check light, if it turns on, your battery's good. Well, I'll check and see what I did wrong when I do the battery change because that battery should be good. Uh, let's see, next one we've got the, oh, the shutter speed index actually is in uh, on the on the camera body, the battery check light is your shutter speed index, and the uh, exposure counter is over here on this side, telling you how many exposures you've taken. In addition, there's the uh, film ISO. Uh, right now, it's it says ASA on these due to the camera's age, but the ISO setting is over here. On the front of the camera. We have the lens mount, which we talked about briefly. It's the uh, dual bayonet mount. You can see how enormous this really is. You can see the, that enormous, enormous mirror in here. There's a 35 millimeter camera for comparison. It's huge. It's really, really huge. It's beautiful to look at. Anyway, um, We've got the lens mount with the double bayonet. We've got over here strap lugs, and you can attach a, a neck strap with those. We've got the shutter uh, or mirror reset button. There's a little button here on this side, which is flush mount with the camera body. And if you trigger the shutter without a battery in the camera, it locks up halfway because the shutter mechanism is operated by the uh, by the battery and now I can't advance the film or anything so what you do is push this button with something like a ballpoint pen and it flips the mirror all the way up hit the sh shutter button again to drop the mirror and then you advance the film and you lose a frame. The, sh the shutter does not operate when you do that, but um, that lets you know that you need to put a new battery in. I've learned that the hard way more than once. 
yeah, it's embarrassing. Uh, anyway, so then we've got the battery check lamp and, oh wait, wrong one. We've got the mirror lockup lever right here. That's the lever to lock up the mirror. The only problem is, um, I think that you can hit this button to undo that. Nope. Once the mirror is locked up, it's locked up. I've lost a few frames locking up the mirror because I can't, if there is a way to unlock it after it's locked up, I don't know what it is and I can't do it on this camera. Uh, at any rate, I've lost a few frames that way too. I've got the de depth of field preview. Now the depth of field preview is built into the lens. So on the lens, you might be able to see it says auto. Now it says manual. So you switch this from auto to manual and you've got your depth of field preview. Switch it back. And it works just like any automatic diaphragm fram lens. Got the camera grip pin. Oh yeah, those are part of the lens mount. Uh, this is the, the lens mount locking pin, and then here we've got the camera grip pin, which uh, gives you something to, to hold on to with the camera. And which hel is helpful because this, this thing's extreme size and weight, that's actually pretty useful. And uh, the lens release, the lens release button is over here. It's on the opposite side of the, six, uh, of the Pentax K mount, and the uh, lens rotates in the same direction as the Pentax K, I think. Can't remember off the top of my head. And then also on this side over here we have the FP and X flash sync ports. And like I said, the X is a 1 30th of a second. The FP, there's a, a chart, but FP bulbs aren't made anymore. So it's not really super useful. Most, most flashes that are used, in fact all flashes that are used are, are X flashes, electronic flashes. And um, this will take a standard electronic flash. It will not take a Canon flash because the triggering voltage is different. But the Canon flashes really only work on Canon flashes. And Sony flashes only work on Sony's because the hot shoe shape is different. And, you know, there's that. Anyway, uh, on the camera back, we have, well, we're going to start on the sides. Here is the camera film door release. And popping it open even though, and that's not actual film in there, that's just a paper backing. And then over here we've got the 120 and 220 marker. Now you'll notice that my camera still says frame 5, and that's because the shutter counter does not release, does not reset until the entire frames of, uh, roll of film has been used, which is different from 35 millimeter cameras. The uh, also on the back we have the film type window and it says 120 right now. I'm going to slide this over, slide this over like that, and now it says 220. And by moving the plate uh, you re set the reminder for what your film type is. I th I'm not sure whether or not the plate plate's position has an effect on the film plane. I don't think it does. Uh, because the Pentax 6x7 and 67 later kept the film more perfectly flat than any camera without a vacuum flattening system. So I don't think the actual position matters so much as it's setting a reminder window for you. In fact, I don't think the 67 II has the adjustable um, film pressure plate. And then uh, the last thing on the back are the, uh, the last things are the battery check button and then the uh, viewfinder if you have any of, if you have either the standard prism or the metering prism viewfinders attached. And then the, ty the film type dial over here, like I said. Uh, on the camera bottom, we have the battery cover. And it takes the, this takes a 4LR44 6 volt battery. I believe it's also called a 28L. We've got the tripod bushing, and then there's some tripod bases have a, a a pin that you can collapse in, but this has a hole for it, and that helps keep the camera mounted 
firmly on the tripod so it doesn't rotate back and forth under the camera's weight. And then over here we have the film spool locks and releases. And in the second video when we talk about changing the film, I'll show you how that works. So inside the camera looks basically like any other 35mm camera with a few differences. And they're not major. The basic design and layout will be familiar to you if you've seen any of my other videos. Over here is where the film goes. Got spool film, and it's a little bit different than cassette film. And you put the spool in here, and then there's a take-up spool over here where the film and paper transport across and get taken up by the film spool. And then you're left with an empty spool that then goes and is used over here for the next, next film spool. So the film loads in here, and in the second video I'll show you how to load the film. And then there's a, a tensioner right here which keep, helps keep pressure on the film. A roller, a roller, a roller, a roller. Another tensioner under this spool, a roller, and then this fantastic film plate, which combined with the film um, film ra rails as well, are the reason that this camera keeps film perfectly flat and is a very takes very very precise and sharp images because of the film plane's flatness. Uh, you can see here that it has guide rails on the outside and inside, similar to what we've seen for uh, 35 millimeter cameras. There's something here that says 120 with an arrow and then an arrow and 220, and film, film rolls, when you start them, have uh, a double arrow. Now this is the end here, but you can see it has a double arrow. When the film starts, you line up the films, you advance the, uh, the you put the film in here and advance it, and then the arrows line up with that, and you'll get to see exactly how that works in the second video. It's, uh, it's standard for 120. If you've used 120, it's the same system as, as you've used before. So let's talk a little bit about lens compatibility. As I said earlier on, the 6x7 system by Pentax had 42 lenses available, of which I have three. Um, I will not ever own all 42. It would be great, but there's just no reason. I don't need more than five. At any rate, uh, I have the, the 105, which is the standard, the the 200, which is like a uh, 100 to 135 in that range, and then the 55, which is like a 28. The 55 is pretty gorgeous. You can see its, its general shape and the 4-inch glass on the front of it. Uh, it's just an enormous, enormous piece of optical glass right on the front. It's so cool. Anyway, um, and then the 200, which is another pretty cool looking lens. I always love lenses. You can look through them and it just looks like they're a hollow tube. The 200 has this built-in shade. Built-in shades are generally kind of cheesy. If you're going to use a lens shade, you should get a metal screw-on lens shade. That way, if you drop your lens, heaven forbid, or if you bump into something, the lens shade gets bent instead of collapsing and your lens element getting scratched or something to that effect. Uh, at any rate, the um, so the camera, as I said, had two bayonets. The inner bayonet was for the fisheye 35 millimeter, which had 100 and it wasn't a full 180 degree. I think it was a 150 degree field of view. It may be more. Anyway, it's a the the fisheye on this is equivalent to an 18 millimeter fisheye in 35 millimeter terms, uh, and up to the 1,000 uh, millimeter. Uh, which is approximately equivalent to a 550. The 6x7 lenses were some of the best of their time. The very first used a single layer coating system that Pentax used at the time, but shortly thereafter they switched to Pentax's proprietary 7 layer coating system. Now let me tell you, having shot uh, lenses from Pentax, including this video right now is being filmed on an FA limited 31mm um, lens, and it, it's not possible to make that lens flare. And the reason is because of Pentax's coating system, which is, some of you are going to disagree with this, but not, but you're wrong, Pentax's coating system is better than Zeiss's. So now having said something which is very likely to start a flame war in the comments, for which I apologize, Pentax does have the best coating system available on the market for professional level lenses. 
it's also better than Canon's L lenses, uh, evidenced by the flare tests which demonstrate that. Um, at any rate, so there are adapters you can use to use the 6x7 lenses on the 645s and K-series uh, K cameras. However, you'll lose the automatic diaphragm functionality. And that's just part and parcel to adapting lenses from one system to another. You can adapt uh, you could adapt these to Nikon or Canon and have the same problem. In fact, you could adapt Nikon lenses onto Canon and you'd lose the functionality. So that's, that's just part of adapters. Also, these cameras are especially good for astrophotography. They mount very, very easily to telescopes, and because of the perfectly flat film plane, they can be used for extended duration images on film to capture very good detail uh, of, of distant galaxies and solar systems and stars and things like that, and they're, they were very, very popular for astrophotography for that reason. So a lot of myths exist about the Pentax 6x7, and I picked some of the popular ones that I know of, and I wanted to address some of them and uh, to, to try and clear up some of the air about this. The first myth, the, the camera, the Pentax 6x7, is sharper than a Hasselblad. The answer to that is sort of. Hasselblads use 6x6 negatives, which require cropping to print, so there's a little bit of enlargement to do a print. So there's, uh, so therefore there's resolution loss on a print just inherent to the act of printing an image from a Hasselblad. However, on a lines per millimeter basis, and that's how lenses are tested lines per millimeter, the, the lens I'm filming this with has 2400 lines per millimeter, which is incredibly sharp, especially for a wide angle. Um, I don't know, that's the only lens I own that I know that figure on, so that's why I'm giving it as an example. On a lines per millimeter basis, though, however, Hasselblad lenses are modestly sharper. They have a modestly larger number of lines per millimeter. The second, the metering prism is a must-have. The answer to that is not really. The magnifying and waist level prisms are fantastic tools in the right situations. The metering prism the problem with the cadmium sulfide cells in, the, in these metering prisms is that they lose accuracy over time and they can only be recalibrated to a point. This prism's not perfectly accurate. It's close enough, and in fact its inaccuracy renders black and white photos with an incredibly cinematic film noir effect that I happen to really, really love. And um, but, uh, but over time the meters lose their accuracy, and in fact um, I knew of one guy who had multiple meters, and each of them registered the same thing differently because they had different accuracies and couldn't be brought back into factory specifications. So there are a lot of people who shoot these who just use the non-metered prism, because it's a little bit lighter, and carry a handheld meter. And you can get a handheld wide angle and, and spot meter that's, a, that's adjustable for your needs, a little expensive, but a lot of people do that and are very, very happy doing it that way. The third myth, the camera can't be handheld. Well, look, you can look at the camera and see that that myth is false. It's designed like an old Spotmatic and has many of the same features and layout and, and it's designed like any SLR. In fact, it's, it's based on an older model, the, the, the Pentacon, or, uh, Pentacon 6, which was a 6x6 SLR. That's where part of where this idea came from. And absolutely this camera can be handheld. In fact, as I said earlier, I've handheld this camera, this very camera, without shake, using the 55 and the 105 lenses as slow as 1 30th of a second. Now, I'm also a fairly strong guy, but at that, most people would be able to handhold this. In fact, I think the weight is an advantage because it has so much mass even though it's got a heavy mirror that sounds like a truck and a shutter that just f shoots back and forth with, with a, lot of, a lot of inertia, the camera's mass is hard for all of that to move in sudden jolts. So I don't think this is any less stable handheld than a 35 millimeter SLR. If you're using a, tel a long telephoto on a tripod, especially if the tripod's not good, yeah, it's going to be less stable. But for most shooting conditions, I think it's just fine for being handheld. Fourth myth, the mirror vibration makes slow films impossible without a tripod. 
The answer to that is partly that yes, the mirror does shake the camera, more so than with a 35mm because the mirror is larger and has a lot more mass. But if you hold the camera firmly, and mo most people can handhold this camera to 1 125th without, without an issue. Also, if you use super fast films like ISO 800, you can still obtain very usable prints because the negatives for this are 4.3 times larger than the negatives for a 35 millimeter. So you don't have to enlarge these as much, which means you don't get grain as quickly, so you can use faster films and still obtain acceptable results. Myth 5. This camera is awful for street use. That's not been my experience. I've used this camera for street photography before, and people just think it's a big SLR. Only once have I ever had someone comment on it, and I used to walk around San Francisco with this thing on, and some people would look at it, and eyebrows would raise, but only once did anyone comment on it. And most people just thought I was a tourist carrying an SLR because it looks like an SLR and not like a typical medium format camera. It's not incredibly conspicuous which I know is a strange thing to say, because it's huge. Myth it's six. True. <laughs> myth, yeah, myth six. There we go. Wedding photographers should use this camera. Well, no, that myth is not true. This is not a wedding photography camera. The reason for that is because it's loud enough to disturb the ceremony, and the slow flash sync makes daylight photograph flash photography impossible. And so if you're going to be shooting a, a wedding use a Hasselblad or something like that. Um, you know, one, uh, even some of the Russian cameras are, are quiet. Some other medium format camera, a 645, uh, is just a fine option too because it's really, really loud, the 6x7. Uh, the, last, the last myth, myth 7, Pentax 6x7s can shoot images that rival 4x5 cameras. So this is a complicated question. In terms of camera movements, the answer is clearly no. 4x5 cameras, and, and when we do my Calumet cameras in the future, we'll see what is meant by camera movements. 4x5 uh, four, four large format cameras give camera movements that, that really that no other system can match. And I've heard that 6x7 images can be enlarged to more than 20 by 24 with no Im image resolution loss. Now that said, for instance, uh, using motion picture 35mm film in my Pentax K2, uh, I enlarged an image to 24 by 36 inches with, no with uh, a resolution loss that's only noticeable if your nose is rubbing up against the print. So there are different factors such as film type, film quality, and larger lens. Um, original imaging lens, things like that. On a sturdy tripod with a standard or wide-angle lens, then yes, I submit that the, the Pentax 6x7 images can be enlarged almost as much as a 4x5 negative. A 4x5 negative will have, will still have more enlarging ability because the the negative size is so much larger, and at the end of this video I'll show you a comparison of negative sizes, 35, 6x7, and 645. But the 4x5 is 101.6 millimeters by 127 millimeters, huge compared to this. And so there is a greater amount of enlargement, but in practical terms, there's not as much enlargement because there's not tons of demand to enlarge a 4x5 image to its maximum enlargeable size. So on a 20 by 24 enlargement, it will be difficult to tell the difference between a, a, a good 6 by 7 image taken with good film and a 4 by 5 image without camera movements. So lastly, some camera don'ts. Don't touch the shutter. Don't touch the fabric shutter ever. You will brick your camera if you break it. Uh, don't touch the mirror because you'll desilver the mirror and you won't be able to get as good an image because you won't be able to focus as well and you'll lose image brightness through the prism. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because it will cause heat damage and it will ruin them very quickly. And this equipment is not cheap. These professional cameras are very expensive. Uh, do not store your gear in a plastic bag because you'll get fungus. In fact, uh, the Pentax manual uh, I'm re uh, the, Pen the Pentax Way, which is a huge books book on, on photography, specifically says that the, the per one of the preferred storage methods is to put them in a, an airtight case, like a Pelican case, which is what I use, with 
an abundance of desiccant, and I use a three point a three and a half cubic foot desiccant packet that's rechargeable in an oven, and that does a very good job of keeping the cameras dry and prevents fungal growth. Then the, uh, don't let your camera get wet. These old cameras are not waterproof. They're not designed to be in rain or mist or fog. Uh, so don't let it get wet. And just remember your camera is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you do that, then your camera is going to last a long time and help you take really good high quality photos. So we're going to wrap this video with a, uh, a quick look at frame sizes. And uh, here are three common frames. And these, these are not going to be to scale depending on the size of your monitor. But they are scale to each other. So in the upper left you can see we have uh, a representation of the APS-C frame size and the ratio in this is correct. And this is the standard crop sensor that most DSLRs have. Uh, the Canon crop sensor is slightly smaller, something about like that. Uh, I forget the exact dimensions for that. But this is, this is the standard Pentax and Nikon crop sensor size. And then this, this next box represents full frame or 35 millimeter negatives. And uh, so this is, so this one is 15.6 by 23.4 millimeters. This is 24 millimeters by 36 millimeters. And now we have the Pentax 6x7, which is 55 millimeters by 70 millimeters or 4 times, 4.3 times larger than the full frame, as we said. Uh, the 4x5 I don't, I don't have here, but it's basically uh, almost 4 times larger than the, the 6x7. This is 55. Uh, the 4x5 is 101.6, so twice as, almost twice as tall. And this is uh, 70, and the, uh, the, the 4x5 is 127, so 1.5 times as wide. So it's maybe like 3, 3.5 three times the size of the 6x7, the, the 4x5 negative. So this gives you an idea of the different sizes of frame and the reason why a 6x7 can be enlar enlarged with greater uh, resolution or greater, greater image quality than a 35mm negative is because there's just less distance to go. To enlarge a 6x7 to an 8x10 print uh, really is it's um I think it's about a four and a half five times enlargement something like that it's not that much compared to a 35 millimeter negative which is a much greater enlargement rate and for most 35 millimeter negatives that 8 by 10 is going to be close to the limit 11 by 14 is really about the biggest that a, a high qual that, a, that many high quality 35 millimeters can be pushed without the grain showing and without resolution loss. So all that said, if you have any comments or questions, well thank you very much for those of you who have made it through this entire and very long video. But if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I'd be more than happy to respond as quickly as I can. I'm pretty good about responding fairly fairly quickly. Also if you'd like to uh, to, to like this video down below the mouse here, that would be great. That lets me know I'm on the right track. You can also subscribe down below the mouse here again, and you'll know when I have more videos that are released. And uh, that, oh yeah, and also if you have any requests for videos, let me know. And if I have the equipment and technical knowledge to film them, I'd be more than happy to. And the last thing I'd like to say is thank you guys for watching.